All right, well, last time we left off uh, in Ecclesiastes chapter number 9, and we're kind of going as a guide through this book by uh, Daniel Estes, uh, Life and Love. And I don't think we're going to cover the love part, which is Song of Solomon, but we are going to cover the life part, which is Ecclesiastes. Solomon gave some advice, and we'll just read that advice again in chapter 9, verses 7 through 10. He said, Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, drink thy wine with a merry heart, for God now accepteth thy works. Let thy garments be always white, let thy head lack no ointment. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun, all the days of thy vanity, for that is thy portion in this life, and in thy labor which thou takest under the sun. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. And so we see here a very optimistic picture of life from Solomon. And that is, you know, hey, you know, God blesses you with bread. Don't feel bread, bad about eating the bread. God blesses you with wine. Don't feel bad about drinking the wine. You know, God blesses you with, with nice clothing. Don't feel bad about, you know, wearing the nice clothing. You know, God blesses you with uh, ointment, you know, which is kind of like our, you know, cologne or deodorant today. Don't feel bad about putting it on. You know, God gave you a wife when you were young. You know, enjoy your wife. Um, you know, you, you work hard and you make wise choices. You know, be thankful for it and enjoy it. So that sounds like a good thing. The only problem with that is we live in a broken world. And it doesn't always, <clears throat> and I might even say it doesn't typically work out that way for people. And so in order to keep people from being uh, uh, disillusioned or to be or being crushed when they, they work hard and their best efforts don't bring them what they hoped for, uh, Solomon gives us here a warning in verses 11 through 18 of chapter number 9 of Ecclesiastes. And so let's look at verses 11 and 12 of Ecclesiastes chapter 9. He says, I returned and saw under the sun, that means on the earth, that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. For man also knoweth not his time, as the fishes that are taken in an evil net, as the birds that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time, when it falleth suddenly upon them. So what do we see in these verses? <clears throat> we see here that natural ability and opportunity do not necessarily guarantee success. Uh, using the illustration that's here, you know, world-class athletes can lose races. I remember growing up, there was a guy named uh, Bo, uh, Bo uh, what was his name? He played for the Raiders for a while. He played baseball for a while. Jackson. Bo Jackson. Yeah, Bo Jackson. And he was just an up-and-coming athlete. And I remember, actually, I think I was at home during this game. They were playing against the Cincinnati Bengals. And he got injured. And this guy, Bo Jackson, who had his whole career ahead of him, was out of it. He was out of it. He never was the great athlete that he was before, after this incident. So the great athletes, you know, the, the fast runner, as it says here, can be taken out of the race. Hit that hole, break your leg, you're out of it. You know, things can change on a dime, as they say. We see here also that uh, brilliant thinkers, you know, can be baffled by hard issues. Um, strong workers, highly skilled workers, can fail to complete important projects. 
In other words, what is it saying here in our, our passage here? It's saying here that things can happen in life to change your plans in an instant. And uh, there are two things that this passage says are constants for all people. There are two things that every one of us is going to experience in life. And the, the, the first word we see here is the word chance. Now the word chance is not speaking from God's perspective, but it's speaking from our perspective. Uh, the word chance here is not talking about what we call fate. I had a professor in college, and they said that one time he asked, well, what is the definition of providence? And of course, the definition of providence is God is in control of all things. And the student spoke up and said, fate? <laughs> and he said, no. You know, he said, where are the sticks? I want to burn you. You're a heretic. <laughs> because from God's perspective, things don't happen by chance. But from our perspective... You know, things happen by chance. There are things that are coincidences. Never from God's perspective, but from the way that we look at it. So chance, this is how it appears to us, but we know that ultimately God is in full control. We were talking about that on Sunday night, the decree of God. And we mentioned this verse in Ephesians 1.11. Speaking of God, it says, him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. You know, sometimes things may appear to be unpredictable. Something may appear to be by chance. But they may take us by surprise, but they never take God by surprise. Because God is doing what he says in Romans 8, 28, working all things together for good, to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And he could not work everything to our good and his glory if he was not in control, if he was not in control. But for us, it's like, where did that come from? <laughs> you know, that's the way we see things in life, but that's not the way God sees things. So one thing that happens to everyone is what we would call chance, and that is, yeah, we may be strong one day, we may be wealthy one day, we may have all these great plans, we may have it all figured out, then all of a sudden something comes and, as they say, rocks our world. You know, that's something that's going to happen to all of us. The second thing, the word that's used here is time, but a word you could use for time here is death. So time and chance happen to us all. And it says here in verse 12, man knoweth not his time. That's a quote I get a magazine called World Magazine. And in there, their obituary section, section. That's the verse they use to introduce it. Man knows not his time. God knows. You know, it's appointed the day that we're going to depart from this earth. God knows our time. He knows when we're going to die. But we do not know when we're going to die. And it can happen at any moment. These things that we have no control over can happen at any moment. Us being taken out of this life, it can happen at any moment. It says here in verse number 12, like the fish that are taken in a net, an evil net, the birds that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon them. Suddenly, unexpectedly, unforeseen events happen. Natural disasters, economic downturns, sickness, death, they come without warning. We cannot predict when such events are going to strike. However, what do we do? Well, we rest in the fact that God our Father controls all of life, and for whatever reason, he has not chosen to allow us to completely understand all of his ways. And you know, uh, that's, uh, Brother Raymond was talking about his eye thing with his cataract. He said the first time he had a cataract taken off a week ago, 
he said, man, I didn't think it was going to hurt like that. And so guess what? The second time he goes in, he's got that fear and understanding <laughs> that he didn't have the first time. He said the second time was better. And you know, he mentioned it to him. You know, hey, I need some more dope or whatever, you know. But uh, you see, going into life, you know, if you knew what you know now, you would probably not make a lot of the choices you made that in God's providence you made. Because you wouldn't want to go through the struggles that you've gone through. And that is the wisdom of God not telling us. And so the Bible says what? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. You know, we're not promised the map. <laughs> but we're promised a lamp to show us the potholes and to show us our next step. And so this is what Solomon's saying. Look, it's great. You know, you have food. You have something to drink. You've got clothes, you've got ointment, you have a wonderful wife that you've been with since your youth, you know, you, you have a job, you work, enjoy it. But be aware, things happen. Chance and time, they happen. Okay, so here's some questions, discussion questions. I don't have much discussion. My wife's not in here, she's usually the discusser. But um, what should be a Christian's attitude toward unpredictable calamities. What should our attitude be toward unpredictable things? God's in control. That's right. Just like those little signs and those t-shirts said in this area. I love it. God's got this. You know, if we're God's child, we know he loves us. We know he wants what's best for us. God is in control. That's exactly right. Okay. So how can we keep an uncertain future from robbing us of a joyful life now. Enjoy life now. That's what Solomon said. And leave it in God's hands. Enjoy the day he's given us and leave the future in God's hands. Any thoughts about Solomon's wise advice? right that's right that's right yeah that's over in the book of james and uh you're referencing we'll turn there and we'll look at it because that's a good reminder good reminder <clears throat> it says here in verse 13 of chapter 4 of james go to now ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow for what is your life it is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanishes away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. What is he saying here? He's saying you have no control over the future. The only thing we have control over is the here and now. And so if there's something that you know that God wants you to do or something that you know God wants you to quit doing, do it today because you're not guaranteed that future when you say, oh, well, come first of the year, I'll make a New Year's resolution. Or, oh, when I turn such and such age, I will start whatever. Because what the, the scripture is saying that you're referencing is we only have today. And you don't know chance and time. You know, chance as we see it, not as God sees it, and death are two things that can come upon us. Just like a fish getting caught in that net. Just like a bird getting caught in that trap. It can happen when we least expect it. And so we need to do today what it is that God wants us to do. That's good. Anyone else? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And that's the thing. What you're saying is that, uh, you know, you think, well, I'll just receive Christ. I'll get right with God. I'll repent. I'll change my ways, however you want to word it, when I get older. But the fact of the matter is, you don't know when chance or time might intervene and you not have that opportunity. Or God could allow that desire to be taken away. You know, if his spirit is working today, that's one thing as we go through Genesis. You know, he says, my spirit will not always strive with man. And that's a scary thought. You know, 120 years, he said, and then it's all over. It's all you're going to get. And so as God is working in our hearts, we need to respond because God, you know, spirit may not <clears throat> strive forever. And as you get older, too, you see how God has worked through the circumstances and even those things that were supposedly unexpected in order to bring out his greater end. And I remember sitting with Brother Lee Burnham over in Pound and him saying he wrote out a book. He said he's not going to publish it. He just wrote it, showing how God had led him all the way in his life and how everything truly worked together for good and for God's glory. Amen. Anyone else? I need to go to him now, but I've got this sin in my life yeah. that I'm going to have to take care of before before I go to God. I've got to straighten my ways up. I've got to do better before that I mm -hmm. can go to God. Yeah. That's not the way it works. Well, that is the lie of the devil. You know, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. And don't put off in the future because you don't know when your appointment's going to be here. Or you don't know when something might happen that totally changes your situation. Amen. I got a good friend I talked to, and he, he basically told me that he knows about God, and he just said one day. Get mm, one day. One day. That's uh, words that are probably repeated by people in hell for all of eternity. One day. One day, and that one day never came. That's good. What else? Well, that was the biggest thing when I was little. You know, the church. You got plenty of time. Mm. Yeah, you know. But now one day the preacher's like, you don't have plenty of time. Yeah. Yeah, I blew. Yeah, blew. <laughs> and then my fault. Natalie, God feels sorry for me right at the end. Mm. Wow, that's so good. Hmm. Wow. God, God again. Amen. Yeah, the fact that you uh, passed up an opportunity to be saved, and then God's Spirit worked again to draw you back to Himself is is not anything that He was uh, obligated to do, but out of His grace, we praise God He did it. Absolutely. Amen. Never think that everything can't change in your life. Amen. Anyone else? It's good stuff. Let's keep going in our passage here, verses 13 through 15 of Ecclesiastes chapter 9. It says, This wisdom have I seen also under the sun, which means on the earth. And it seemed great unto me. There was a little city and a few men within it. And there came a great king against it and besieged it and built great bulwarks against it. Now there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no man remembered that same poor man. <laughs> Do you understand the scenario here? It seems very plain to me. You have a king, a very powerful king, who attacks a small village. And... Although the village was completely outmanned and outgunned, you might say. There weren't guns back then. Uh, there was a poor wise man. And I could just see him now. I have a thought. I have a thought what we might could do. And this poor wise man has a thought. And whatever his thought was, delivered the village from defeat. And as Solomon is going through this book, 
you know, extolling, you know, wisdom and humility and things like that. You know, this poor wise man would be pretty high in, in Solomon's estimation. And yet, what does it say happened to this poor wise man? It says here what? It says, uh, yet no man remembered that same poor man. This guy who had rescued this small city from this big king just a few years later. It's like, who's that guy uh, that helped us out? You know, then a few more years later, nobody even talks about it. He's forgotten. And so what is Solomon trying to tell us here? He's trying to tell us that you may be the kind of person that was talked about in verses 7 through 10. You may be the kind of person who's wise and who's living for God the way you ought to live. But you know what? Don't expect to be recognized by this world for it. Because the ways of God are not the ways of this fallen world. And just like this poor old man who saved the city, right? Just push him aside. Just forget about him. Just be ready for that. And I can tell you in ministry, that's something you'll, you'll see a lot you know, where, you know, you may, you know, be there for someone and then just all of a sudden you're, you're forgotten. And, but the main thing is, who remembers? God remembers. And he doesn't forget. And at the uh, judgment seat of Christ, you know, when we receive our rewards for what we've done, what matters is not what men thought of us, but what God thinks of us. And that's what God, what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, when you do your alms, when you give your gifts, don't do them to be seen of men because you'll have your reward. You know, don't do them to have a monument. Don't do them to be praised. Don't do them to better your name in the community. Just do them quietly for the Lord. And then he who seeth in secret will one day reward you openly. And that's true with parenting, is it not? <laughs> You know, you help your kids or you do something for your kids and you know that they would have been totally destroyed without it. And yet seemingly they just brush it off as if it's nothing. And you can say, oh, you know, don't you know what I'm doing for you? You know, and then yet it's just like, well, I did it for God. I did it for God because I know he wants me to raise my kids the right way and to help them out all I can. And I'm just going to leave it in his hands. So don't expect recognition if you live this model life that Solomon is presenting in this book. You understand that? Okay. So we have three wisdom principles in the next three verses. All right. Let's see what they are. Verse number 16. Then said I, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. Wisdom principle number one. They said if I had a chalkboard, I should write them on the chalkboard. So it shows how old that this, this material is. Wisdom is better than strength, but it's not always valued by other people. Wisdom is better than strength, but it's not always valued by other people. And may I say this in the age we live in, it's not usually valued by most people. Okay? So here it is, you know, wisdom is better than strength, but the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. Verse number 17, the words of wise men are heard in quiet more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. Here's the second great point they want to bring out here, this wisdom principle. Quiet wisdom is better than loud foolishness. <laughs> Do we not need that in our day? <laughs> quiet wisdom is better than loud foolishness. Many people clamor to hear a fool's attractive, bold words. Fools often speak what others want to hear rather than what they need to hear. They draw a large following. But in contrast, true wisdom is what Jesus called the narrow way. The narrow way that leads to life. But most people prefer the enticements of foolishness over the narrow way of life. 
And this is where I think, as a country, we are in danger. I don't care if it's right or left or who you're talking about, but we have people that will incite people and people that will say what they want to hear, and then you have these people in the background who make sense, but they never get heard because nobody wants to listen to them. They're boring. They're dull. Preachers. Can I say that? You know, I love energetic preaching. But if there's nothing to it, there's nothing to it, okay? So, and so the style of a man's preaching isn't what makes the preaching good or bad. It's the substance of what's in it. Are they going to the Word of God? Or are they talking about mamma, papa, and tradition, and, and whatever? You know, as my pastor in Kentucky would say, different texts, same message every time you hear it. And so this is true in, in, in the political life. It's true in church life. It's true in the business world. You know, the guy with the flashiest presentation. True in the education world. You know, you say, well, education is supposed to be full of wisdom. Well, if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, then there's a lot of foolishness in the education world. You know that if you've gone through that. But, but anyway, so here it is. You know, quiet wisdom is better than loud foolishness. That is what Solomon is saying. But it's not appreciated. It's not appreciated. All right, so verse number 18, the last wisdom principle, and then we're done. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. What is it saying here? Much wisdom can be undermined by a small amount of foolishness. Much wisdom can be undermined by a small amount of foolishness. Just as it takes just a little bit of poison to pollute a large water supply, in the same way, a little bit of foolishness can overturn a large amount of wisdom. The fool rejects God's way. The fool, therefore, rejects truth. And as a result, he brings destruction to himself and to those who are around him. Solomon pointed out that true wisdom is best. And we know what true wisdom is. It's the fear of the Lord. It's a proper reverence for God. To trust him, to submit to him, to honor him. But it's often undervalued, overlooked, or rejected. And so this is where we're at tonight. Roger.